Hey, good morning, you guys. Welcome back to the channel. This morning, I'm going to be doing a simple character study, three-quarter view of an owl, as part of a character simplification design series using uh, one of the products that the wonderful people over there at XP Pen sent me. I'm going to be using the XP Pen Artist 22 second generation, and we're going to be working in Photoshop today, so enjoy the process. Okay, so let's get started. Um, as promised, I will be doing a owl three-quarter view, and I want to run through just simple, you know, using simple shapes, simple ideology to create the character and build the character as I go and explain to you my process of thought as I sketch and illustrate and draw this character in a digital environment. As you see, this is the XP Pen 22, uh, Artist 22, and this is a wonderful device that uh, the guys over there at XP Pen um, provided for this uh, demonstration um, tutorial. So let's go ahead and get started. We're in Adobe Photoshop, and I'm running it off of an all-in-one file new. And all-in-ones, if you're not familiar with those, all-in-ones are kind of the industry name for combining a tablet such as a Galaxy or a Samsung um, derivative product or an Apple iPad, and you're combining it with a laptop. So a lot of times you'll have such as a Surface, a Lenovo, a Dell, one of those products that runs Windows 10. And the product is just the hardware, and then you have the software, which is Windows um, 10. So that's what I'm running today. So I like having my document at full resolution. I like using RGB color at 8-bit, because it utilizes, I can utilize a lot of the filters. Whenever you get up into the higher bit, like the 32-bit, some of the filters won't work. I'm not sure if it's the complexity or the intricacies involved in Photoshop, but at the end of the day, this is what I use. I'm at a, a horizontal orientation. As you see, the uh, canvas on the XP Pen 22 is in a horizontal fashion. I don't utilize it in the portrait fashion, so um, that's why I create my document that way. And we're at 22 by 12, which I believe the diagonal measurement of this particular device is 21.5 and it is at 1080p resolution. So it is a really good resolution um, for doing illustration. And uh, what else, what else? Uh, yeah, oh yes, and I create on a mid-tone background. And the reason for that is because I like to have a mid-tone to be able to have my lights and my darks. And my mid-tone is usually um, a nice value of, uh, of uh, black and white to you know, do color flats or put in local color. So that being said, let's go ahead and create the document. Okay. And there it is. I've got the, oh, actually it's not paired with it. My apologies for that. So this is a really good example of, um, of uh, you know, utilizing a product and then, um, you know, whenever I've uh, taken part of the product out, I've, I've stored this and now that I've gotten it out, this is the uh, XP Pen remote. And what's really cool about this device is it can pair with pretty much any device uh, that is uh, either Windows or uh, Mac compatible. All it has is a little USB dongle in the back. So let's go ahead and pop that out. It's really easy. Just use your fingernail and it pops right out. The dongle goes into your USB port on the side of your machine. So let's go ahead and put that in really quick slides right in the USB and it connects via Bluetooth so I go ahead and turn it on little switch on the back it takes a I believe AAA battery and then what I've done is I've gone in and programmed my quick keys to coincide with the program I'm using so I programmed certain quick keys into Photoshop and look so I can go in and without having a keyboard or having to have the laptop or all-in-one on my left or to facilitate um, some type of a setup where I have to have a keyboard, Bluetooth keyboard in front of me. This is a great little device 
that helps me um, you know do illustration and artwork and not having to really worry now if I'm doing fonts if I'm doing really complex illustration then I'm probably going to need a keyboard but this is a really great little travel companion uh, if you guys are wondering I've had a lot of questions about that so the document is up let's go ahead and create a layer okay now uh, I was asked to provide the brushes and one of the brushes that I have actually is uh, I call it my favorite brush so you see I have a lot of brushes so I've got a lot of brushes and this is my favorite brush okay so now that we've created that layer I've got the selected brush and this brush is really cool because it's got um, texture for one okay okay and with the XP pen remote I can utilize a scroll wheel to go ahead and you change the sizing of the brush now if you want to scroll through and change the rotate you can rotate you can see the little menu down below whenever I press the center black button you can zoom so now I can zoom in and out I can scroll through these particular layers brush size which is what I like to keep it on so this brush also supports not supports it has the ability to have tilt which I love and what's really cool again about the device that I'm using is it also supports tilt so let's go ahead and get a nice brush size for sketching and whenever I'm in Photoshop I always remember you know the tools there's always different settings for the tools so we always look up here to make sure that we have the tools set at the proper settings for sketching and drawing according to your preference that's what's really cool about Photoshop because you can program the presets to set it up in a such a way that whenever you come in everything will be exactly the way you want it and uh, this is pretty much my setup you know I've got a couple little variables that I have whenever I do uh, graphic design or book assemblage or something like that. I'm not really into quote unquote um, macro settings like certain actions. So uh, I know that a lot of people use actions with simple quick keys that'll save and stuff like that. And that has to do with workflow. And right now I just, I wanted to show you guys uh, a simplified uh, version of how to create uh, an animal, an owl using simple shapes and you can get some really great results really fast so let's go ahead and get started so with an owl depending on what kind of owl you have uh, I like using uh, really simple shapes so let's go ahead and get rid of that simple shapes and simple shapes being your square right your circle your triangle your rectangle okay so on and so forth you know, we learn those shapes growing up as children, and a lot of times as artists, or even somebody trying to learn, we try to do things quote-unquote organically, meaning the organic shape really overwhelms us. We start thinking of all the curves, especially like in an owl, and the birds, how they've got feathers, and it just, it really overwhelms us. So I think as a beginner, or somebody that has been doing this a while really needs to remember is that you know everything can be you know pretty much broken down into simple shapes and if you have that mentality going in then you won't be overwhelmed as you progress through the illustration and you build on what you have that's an important concept building on what you have you establish right because a lot of times we look at this right here, even in a digital environment, we look at this and what happens? It becomes completely overwhelming. We don't know where to get started. We don't know how to do things. And that's why, you know, getting some simple shapes on the page will really help you. Okay, so moving into this char quote unquote character, what I'm doing is I'm establishing relationship. Relationship being the relationship of the owl his sizing to the relationship to his environment right 
And two, composition and how the composition is going to tell a story and how I want this particular illustration to speak to the viewer. You know, nothing irritates me more to see an illustration that basically forgets its viewer. You know, the purpose of illustration really is to tell a visual story. And that's something that I think a lot of times as beginners we fail to realize that you're trying to tell a story. You're trying to tell a story with shape, line, color, value, light, and all of those principles of design that we learn as we progress through this wonderful, wonderful field called illustration and art. So as you see, I'm drawing really light and with digital tablets, and uh, especially within the last few years, a lot of the uh, product uh, products that are coming out have incredible pressure sensitivity. I believe this particular device has over 8,000 levels of pressure, and that again is one of those misnomers, and uh, misnomer being kind of a misleading statement that pressure is the all-out, you know, defining factor of a tablet, and it is not. You know, I had a tablet years ago that I kept for years, you know, probably eight or nine years, and it only had over one, just 1,026, 1,024 levels of pressure sensitivity. And you're like, man, that's terrible. But I was able to create fantastic art. And the reality is what you guys need to remember is the document plus the machine capability plus the texture of the brush plus the tablet interface, all of those things are working in synchro uh, synchronicity, synchro, you know, they're, they're syncing up to give you a user experience. And even though, you know, some of the older tablets may only have 4,000 levels of pressure sensitivity, most of the time, the pressure sensitivity really doesn't come into effect until you get a really large brush. Because the large brush, right, and you have those levels of pressure sensitivity, even though, now watch, I'm going to draw really fast, and you're saying, well, your computer's terrible, and the pressure sensitivity is terrible. No, this is a very complex document. It's over 22 inches wide, and this brush is extremely textured. So you're having to render that, and the pressure levels help that, but the reality is the pressure levels really don't come into effect until you get into a bigger document. Or, I'm sorry, a bigger brush. And frankly, I don't really use brushes that large. You know, I kind of tend to stay in this area right here. You know, let's see how big she is. Right at around the, actually 200 is really big for me. I'm, I'm a big document again. Okay, so let's go ahead and come down. Now what I'm doing is, I'm a, and as I'm talking, you guys can see that I'm building, I'm establishing. I'm, I'm showing that um, I'm trying to draw, quote unquote, a form. A form being height, width, and depth. That's the one that really gets us. Whenever we start drawing depth, perspective comes into effect. Foreshortening comes into effect. Like if I were to draw the perspective line and I were to have my vanishing points, right? And I have my, pers my perspective vanishing lines come up and how he sits in 3D space. It's that 3D space that I think, think sometimes kind of confuses us. And that's one of the things that, again, takes a little bit of practice and understanding of how we view things as human beings, right? The, the challenge being we as human beings live in a three-dimensional world and when we start drawing on this 2D surface, we have to take our brains and reverse engineer what we're seeing in front of us to match what we know in reality. That's a very weird concept, but it's something that we do and you know, in drawing, and it's and it's literally has to has to be, in my opinion, kind of one of those dichotomy of thoughts. That dichotomy of meaning, you know, I'm thinking in three dimensions automatically because I live in a 3D world. Then I'm drawing on a 2D surface to make it look three dimensional. That whole dichotomy of thought confuses your brain, your eyes and it transfers down to your hand, so suddenly you get really frustrated whenever you draw something and it doesn't turn out the way you want it. That's why you build. And if you notice, I started out with a simple shape. I started out with this big circle, and then I kind of added this bean shape down here, right? To kind of level out and, and represent what uh, an owl would look like. And then I added his head. Again, a circle. 
And I'm trying to keep it simple for you guys so you guys understand that even though it's going to get complex here in a minute, the beginning is always pretty simple. And you'll see me draw these construction lines that help me identify this shape as a form. Remember form, height, width, and depth? That particular shape right here now has a side, it has a back end, it has a front end that's closer to me. And, uh, you know, understanding that, that, uh, that thought process and trying to think in three dimensions is a challenge. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you. It is one of those things that as artists we should, or even beginning artists, we should really look at the world in terms of shapes and then identify those shapes in such a way that, you know, we, we try and look at them, um, in a, in a translative way, you know, from three dimensions that we see into two dimensions to look 3D. <laughs> If that isn't confusing, I don't know what is. Okay, so now we're going to go to his face. Um, what you'll see a lot of times is you'll see character artists and designers, they'll start out and they'll draw this enormous, you know, really lightly, this enormous kind of gobbly gook. So let's go ahead, I'm going to think of composition. What I'm doing right now is I'm going to go ahead and level off some composition items because he's placed, I want to go ahead and have him right here because I want... I want some items over here. Maybe we have a, you know, part of the tree comes up. And then it comes here. And then we have the other item. Maybe a tree come here and it's splitting off. Okay. Kind of connects with him. Drawing very lightly. But he is the main focus. There's a principle in art and design called the rule of thirds. And you're like, I've heard that. You probably have that it has it's a, it's uh, uh, you know a photography concept that you know probably came from drawing first and then you know became a little more popular with photography. If you go into your phone and you put on the grid, a lot of times that will be your rule of thirds grid. So the rule of thirds, okay, has to do with the zones of the illustration. So you have one, two, three zone, one, two, three zone. Where these lines intersect are called points of interest, and those help you guide your illustration and the viewer. Now remember, I'm doing this for the viewer. I'm doing it to tell a story. I'm doing it to show you how to lead the eye. Now if you look, I've got a shape here of the, of the leaves. I've got a line here that separates the top half from the bottom half. I've got the head, which is on an intersection of the rule of thirds. I've got the body shape that comes around here, because again, this is a shape of plants. This is a shape of the creature or owl. And then I've got this line right here, which represents a tree. Okay. That's going to, again, push your eye to the right. And then I've got some flower, or not flowers, I've got some uh, leaf elements here. Okay, maybe I've got a branch coming up. And I do have a tree kind of right here that kind of intersects. It comes up. And these right here are kind of points of interest too. The corners are areas that you, I don't want to say you stay away from, but what happens inadvertently if you put too much information or you have a line that goes right from here, your eye is going to go straight from it. So if you watch, what I'll do is I'll have this branch come up. It'll come here, like so. Maybe another branch right here. It splits off. Okay, so now I've got this branch, large branch of the tree kind of going into the corner and it balances. Okay, because I'm gonna have some leaves right here. Okay, so now we're going to get back to the character. I'm going to do the, do the face. So the face, again, is a relationship item, meaning I get the shape of the head, I get the size of the head, then I can adjust the rest of the body according to the size of the head. Whenever you draw people, that is kind of a quote-unquote standard. You shape the head, especially if you're drawing realistic. You know, a standard person might be seven and a half, six and a half, seven heads high, 
a superhero might be eight and a half to nine heads high, and then you adjust the character based upon the size of the head. That's why a lot of times you'll see people draw the head first. That's an interesting little element. Also, you'll see something called a line of action, and a line of action has to do with how the, um, the character is positioned. So if you look, his, his back is arched, he's got his shoulders high, Okay, I haven't even drawn the face, and I'm already trying to establish mood. I'm already trying to establish gesture. And these are the things that I think, again, as an artist, if you start establishing them early in your career, you'll be amazing at them whenever you finally get uh, to the point where you can illustrate something with context and content. So, he's going to be kind of an angry owl, because most owls, in my opinion, kind of look angry. So let's go ahead and draw his beak in. Not too big. Right? And then mood. It's important that you place certain items, uh, you know, your eyes, uh, in such a way that you convey mood. Now, I want to go ahead and put in the eyebrows. So when I'm going, actually, I'm not going to do that. Actually, I am. The, in my drawing process, there's a lot of fluid um, drawing because I equate it to, sh uh, to sculpting. Sculpting, to me, you feel things, right? And as I go through the illustration and the sketch and the drawing, I'm feeling things and I want to convey emotion. So what I do is I start, you know, I start kind of sculpting in such a way using the pen. So, if you watch, you'll see it happen very subtly. Because what I'm doing is I'm utilizing these construction lines as a guide. I'm not redrawing anything. I'm using them as a guide to help show me the way. Okay, so now since I've established kind of that three-quarter view of how he's looking at you and he's like, what are you doing? You're near me. I don't like that. And the feathers, although super important and very detailed, Right now, I'm merely putting in some of those items to help the relationship items. So, I do one item here, that establishes where I need to put feathers here, that establishes the eye, that establishes and reaffirms where the beak needs to be, and this is by no means the final. And that's what's great about sketches. Okay. Al's eyes are insanely big. I watched a documentary a while back about Al's because I'm a documentary freak. I love documentaries. It's one of my, it's my jam. And I found out the owl eye occupies 70% of his head. 70%. Of his head and I thought wow that's awesome you know one of those one of those little tidbits of information you know because I've drawn owls before one of those tidbits that helps me understand how I need to balance things a little bit better you know because you know anatomy is important you know don't ever think anatomy is not important even in a stylized character like this Anatomy is going to be important. So let's go ahead and place that other eye. Now this eye right here is going to be smaller. And you're like, well, I, I understand that in, in theory, but why? You know, I, I always ask the why. It's further away from you. It's on that plane of the sphere, so it's going to be distorted. It's like if you were to take this, and I were to show you right plane in front of you, you can see that it's a circle. But what happens inadvertently whenever you turn it? it becomes an oval. And if I were to go further away, it gets smaller. That has to do again with that relationship and that perspective that you need to you know, know and think about whenever you're drawing something such as this. So now the owl comes here. I've got his eye, his eye ocular cavity. Remember I'm thinking 70% of his head. So even though he's got a big eye, you don't see all of it. It's even bigger than what you're seeing. Okay, so let's go ahead and down, face it up. What I like to do a lot of times is I'll take this line at the top of his lid, 
I'll come right here, I'll jump it over to the other side, and that really kind of shows me where the other side of his lid needs to be. Whoops. One of the things I am not, oops, I hit the eraser. One of the things I'm not used to yet with this new setup is the pre-programmed quick keys on the pin and it coincides with the quick keys that I've programmed into here. So if you see me kind of, you know, do a little mess up <laughs> here and there, you're like, you don't mess up. Yeah, I do quite a bit, especially when I'm trying to use new uh, equipment like this. So let's establish that. Now, here's a really good, here's a really good moment where I start thinking, Placement. I need to place certain things early. So here's his pupil. Let's go ahead and jump this over. Here's his other pupil. Now it's good again to draw lightly. Okay. And it's good sometimes if you go ahead and put in a little eye shine, right? Or at least it helps me. Just a little eye shine. And let's zoom out. And you can already see placement. You can already see attitude. You can already see character design. You can really, you know, even that silhouette, that silhouette being the shape of the owl without any uh, interior details. So that silhouette, if I were to color it in, you would be able to determine that it is indeed an owl based upon the outer shape. Similar to if you were to look at Indiana Jones or Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse is a great example. Look at his silhouette. It's very established. It's very well known. You know, you look at that, you could look at that in reverse. You could look at it, you know, at night. You could look at it in the morning and you will know that it is Mickey Mouse. So let's go ahead and draw these over these ocular cavitus areas. Okay, so now I've established, let's go ahead and give him some, we've got his pupil in, let's do an iris. Good. I already did the iris on this one. Okay, and give a little bit of, right there. So now I've established his attitude, what I can do is just kind of, it, it's much easier now, and I've got his shoulder that's right here. And, I, and I'm not, you know, you can get overwhelmed with wings because wings have a lot of feathers, but we're not going to do that. Again, we're going to think simple shapes first, right? Here's a nice big circle. Here's kind of an, an oval that comes down and it intersects with that circle. Here's that line of action. Okay, right, and he's got these talons, and if you notice, I didn't draw the talons singular, I didn't draw them singular first, I did them as a shape, right, because shapes are, and you can do this with hands too, since this one's going to be further away, I'm drawing it a little bit smaller. Okay. And I've got his other wing that kind of juts out. There. So let's zoom out. Okay, so now what I need to look at is the overall silhouette. I need to go ahead and establish his face. It needs to come down. Okay. his head and his face item. If you ever to look at an owl without its feathers, um, it's scary, <laughs> right? I don't, I don't know when that would happen, but I have seen owls without their feathers. Recently, I, I've been doing some illustration work for uh, coloring books and I you know, I, I love doing animals, and that's basically what I'm doing is animals. And uh, one of the things that I really have to always remember in terms of coloring books is detail, detail, detail is not necessarily a good thing. And, you know, putting too much in, you're basically drawing 
uh, for that particular person who's going to to color things in and you don't necessarily want to do that so one of the things that I'm really endeavoring to do especially whenever it comes to feathers and fur is to pay attention to what makes sense in the context of the artwork and that's a lot of words but you have to remember less is always more and that's a weird thing especially whenever it comes to fur right I mean I did a, a, a really cool animal and I had to put fur in there and I completely overdid it and you know I kinda had to choke back of it and, and say to myself okay what really makes sense uh, in this illustration too much fur is not a good thing and and choking back and making sure I, I adjusted that obviously is the right decision not to mention you know you want to cater to your clients quote-unquote needs and wants and desires and even though you you might have a lot of experience and stuff like that a lot of times that that can work against you but if you have a good attitude about it then you realize yeah that is the best decision and then you learn something from it okay so as I go in you see I'm building on what is there I'm not redefining anything particular because I had a strong base and that's that's so true of a lot of things we do not only in life but also uh, especially you know in, in illustration you have a strong base a strong foundation and then your illustration will go well okay so I'm gonna go back to the fact that I drew very simple shapes for the feet talons are interesting because um, you know being a stylized character I don't want to put hyper realism into this. I want to make it a little more cartoony, a little more fun, so his talons are going to be a little bit uh, larger than they normally would be. So let's go ahead and make these like little sausages. Like if you were to take your finger and you were to put it over another form, how it wraps around and goes down, that's what I'm going to do with these. And at the end, I'm going to give them a little bit of claw. And since that, that forefront claw in the very front is going to be a little bit longer and then as it tapers around see it goes like that so you have that big shape and then it comes it comes out and around again I'm thinking like a sculptor okay and then it's zooming out and figuring out in terms of weight where he's going to be so then I go to the other one I could draw that one out just a little bit and he's leaning on this one a little bit more so I need to think okay this one comes here and then his, his foot comes under and then this one comes around good and this one comes around and then finally this one's gonna kind of loop around here I need to watch my tangent if you guys are familiar with that concept or even that word you'll understand that it's basically two intersecting or touching lines you don't want those in your illustration work so a good example of a tangent would be if I went ahead and had the edge of this tree and I placed it right on the edge of that claw that particular talent. The reason why you don't want that is because it it, it flattens uh, your illustration. Flatten being I'm trying to get depth, I'm trying to get distance and this like if I were to take this let's see if this particular tree is in the background if I were to go ahead and do this what that's inadvertently going to do is going to place the owl and the tree on the same plane and I don't want that. So tangents are very important. I see this mistake in a lot of work. Even sometimes, you know, in the midst of me drawing, you know, and trying to overlay and lap and, you know, overlap and do some things, I, I make the mistake as well. So if you make the mistake, just find it, look at it, and Make sure you don't make that uh, mistake. Tangents are terrible. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. All right. So let's 
go ahead and establish this a little bit better. Let's do the leaves here. Okay, so what I want to do, since this is a, a pretty predominant shape that's coming toward me, I think right now he's a little bit too small. So I'm going to go ahead and um, edit, transform, scale. Now I'm going to scale the entire illustration, and I also think he's a little bit too close to that. So let's go ahead and move this down and move this over. Even that small adjustment gave him more presence. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, and even though, let me see here. Okay, here. I'm trying to think here while I draw. Now, what I'm doing is I'm trying to lead your eye a little bit and not have too many kind of overlapping, intersecting planes. Now, one of the things that I think, again, is sorely uh, overused is detail. And as I progress through this illustration, I will detail him first and foremost because he is the focus and I don't want to... I don't want to deter from him. I don't want this plant to deter from him. And it's actually really close to doing that. See, I'm thinking how I can change him. Okay, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about that right now. Now what I don't like is the fact that I can't see the rest of him. <gasps> that stinks. Okay, so I'm okay with that though. I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, it's nice if you see the rest of him, but I, I don't I don't think that's a huge issue. Two, these two little leaves right here will act as pointing devices to point up towards his face. And then we can have maybe some others to kind of point towards him. And these can point a little bit towards him. And as we zoom out, that's a decent, that is a decent rough sketch to get the job done, right? So now that I come in, I can start kind of putting in just slight areas of value. I'm not, I'm not quote unquote illustrating. Let's go ahead and have that leaf right there point toward him. There we go. Good. Good. So let's go ahead and do this. Oops. Here, 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 right? Yes. You know, little shapes here and there that help direct your eye. Okay, so now I'm going back in and I'm reconfirming some of those things that I really, you know, kind of glazed over in the preconcept stage of thought. You know, again, I want that head to be out a little bit more, so I'm going to use variation of line weight. Variation of line weight being thicker on the bottom, thinner on the top. It's like whenever I draw a circle. Let's go ahead and hide this. Okay. Actually, let's file. I haven't saved it yet. <laughs> so let's do... Uh, cancel. So let's do file, save as, let's do desktop, let's do owl, fun. So owl, o, whoops, o, w, l, f, u, n and to the desktop. Yay! Okay, so what I'm going to show you is variation of line weight 
has to do with the pressure that I press down with my stylus onto the canvas, the tablet. So I can go really light or I can go really dark. Okay, that right there in and of itself is a variation of line weight. This is light and thin, this is dark and heavy. Now, since I have the taper on, the taper starts at a specific pixel, which is pretty much zero. And the more that I put the pressure down with the pen, it will darken and it will uh, make it whiter, depending on the size of brush I have. The size I have is 90 pixels, so the maximum width will be 90 pixels. I can adjust that in, um, in my brush settings, but what I wanted to show you is whenever I'd like, if I were to draw a circle, you're like, okay, that's weak sauce. So circle. So to make it more of a sphere, I would keep things light, and then I would come down here, and I would make them dark, and then I would come back, and I would make it light and thin. Again, that is a circle, but suddenly it becomes a sphere whenever you do something as simple as a little bit of variation of line weight. So you can see that I've done that in a couple areas. When I have two overlapping shapes, I will have more of a variation of line weight. And the, the shape that's foreground will have a darker and a thicker line to help define it as a focus element. So some of these, you can see, I've tapered them. And the feathers, even though they're simple, they really are defined as feathers, which is pretty cool. Just because that little bit of variation of line weight Okay, so let's come here. Let's go define his head a little bit better. We moved into a new house with my new studio, which is pretty cool. Very excited. Little side element for you guys. Okay. Simplification sometimes is one of the hardest things to do, especially if you're used to defining things really in a complex way. You know? So this is a rough sketch. Here we go. Of an owl. I'm going to put a little bit of value in there for you guys. Let's go ahead and draw through here. Okay. Come down. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my brush size and I'm going to change brushes. I'm going to go to um, a shading brush and I'm going to take the taper off. This is going to help, again, reestablish this as a form form being height, width, and depth. And I'm going to show you, just with a little bit of value, you can really have a fun drawing sketch. That you can play with. And, and use it to create a much more dynamic illustration. Okay, so light source. You know, I can get into, you know, establishing light source, you know, complexity of light source, what is light, light bouncing, light absorption, but we're not going to do any of that. I am merely showing you, I'm just putting in simple value to help reestablish that form. Okay, let's go in. Establish his eye a little bit. He looks so angry. But again, owls kind of look mad, right? They're already kind of mad. It's because they ain't getting no sleep. They just need a nap. Right? And since I've, I've really kind of established the illustration in terms of simple shapes and form, I can put in the value utilizing 
those simple shapes and forms. And suddenly, it, it has a powerful, you know, it has a powerful sense of, of attitude just by putting in, we'll go ahead, this is going to be a little bit closer, and then it kind of goes away. zoom out. I'll make this darker over here. Make this darker over here. Good. Okay. Now we come to, see I can, and since I'm in Photoshop and I've created an extra layer, I can basically hide that layer and, and, you know, get back to my drawing and my sketch. I'm going to go ahead and add another layer. I'm going to put a little bit of light value in there. So we're going to go to white. We're going to change this to overlay, which is a layer transparency mode. And we're going to go ahead and we're just going to put in a little bit of light here and there. Okay. back, a little bit on these feathers, a little bit on the top of the tree, branch, and then even if I wanted to go in and maybe put some light here, some light there, maybe there's a nice highlight right here to help define this area right there. You know, that's what's great about drawing and illustration work. You can basically do whatever you want and create whatever you want. And with the digital tools, such as this XP Pen uh, Artist 22, along with all of the other XP uh, Pen products and other digital tablets that are out there, you know, you know, the amount of uh, wonderful artwork that you guys can create is really amazing. And you can do it in such a way that is really fast, uh, really efficient, and um, really dynamic. So let's go ahead and put a little bit of definition here, here and there, just a little bit of highlight. I'm not, again, I'm not rendering it. I'm just giving it a little bit of emotion, you know, as a sketch. And this would be a perfect sketch for me to go ahead and render this out and uh, create a fun character. So that's where I wanted to land with you guys today. Hopefully you got something from this little uh, tutorial slash demo. And um, one of the things that uh, I think is always important whenever you create uh, artwork is the fact that uh, even though, you know, let's say you've been doing it a while, let's say you've been in the, in the industry a billion years, there's always a learning process that goes on with every illustration. You know, there's no cookie cutter moment when you kind of just stamp illustrations out. You know, every client is different, every illustration is different. And uh, if you look at it as a learning process, suddenly you can have a little bit more fun because you're not afraid to make mistakes, right? You're not afraid to get in there. You're not afraid to, uh, you know, say, hey, maybe I didn't do something so right. Um, you know, that's okay. And, and the further I look at this, I'm like, I can go in, I can go ahead and place, you know, some dark value down here and I can start establishing mood a little bit better. You know, maybe he's a little bit more sinister. You know, maybe he's he's waiting. He's just waiting for that mouse to come out. So, anyway, thank you guys for visiting the channel. Please like and subscribe. And uh, as always, um, you know, I'm trying to come out with new videos, new style, new tutorials, and uh, hopefully you guys are liking the other Photoshop series of uh, me. You know, putting in color flats and color value um, and rendering uh, and, and showing you my illustration process and how I think and how I go through and, and do things. And, and again, this is, this is not an, an end-all, meaning this is not the only way to do it. This is just my way of doing it. And there are so many other ways. And I, and I encourage you to find those other ways and to absorb them into your own style. So thank you guys for visiting the channel. 
And if you're interested in this XB pen, I don't get any kickbacks. They didn't pay me to do this. They didn't do, I mean, literally, they sent this to me and said, hey, what do you think? You know, do a couple little uh, little tutorials and, and see where we land. And frankly, you know, I've owned other products um, in the marketplace, industry standard products. You know, my first tablet was a Wacom uh, 21UX, and I've used numerous Wacom tablets since then. This is, in my opinion, right on par with the Wacom products, and I think that XP Pen has a great, uh, great thing going. And at the price point of five hundred dollars, it's hard to to pass this up. Does it have the quick keys on the side? No, but that's what this little jewel is for. You know, there's uh, other companies that make quick key remotes, and I've had two of these. The first one I actually accidentally broke, and this is uh, the second one. This retails for about forty-five bucks, and I can pair it with pretty much anything. All in ones, my Mac. You just download a little app, and that app is right here. Here's the interface, and you see I can program stuff in. I can add programs. I can basically have this remote programmed exactly how I want it, and then you know you go and it's here's the other uh, part of the app. You know you can go in and you can change the parameters, you can change the pin settings, you can map things. So I think overall. I give this product a thumbs up and I'm looking forward to utilizing it in other projects and hopefully um, you know you guys uh, can uh, get something from these illustration tutorials and have some fun in the meantime. So thank you guys and we'll see you next time. Bye.